So before we get into the lesson tonight, uh, by a show of hands, anybody need a special touch or know anybody that need touching? I know of several people that are sick within the church, dealing with several different issues. We need to keep up with our people here in church, try to take care of them. We're going to talk about this in in the lesson tonight, but uh, if y'all will, pray with me here before we get started. Heavenly Father, we just come to you tonight. Lord, we just ask that you touch these of, uh, that raise their hand this evening wherever they might be that need a touch whether it be healing, provision, salvation whatever it might be Lord only you can take care of every need we have and that's why we call upon your name tonight Lord we just ask that you have your will and your way in this room tonight Lord I ask that you uh, speak through me by your word and by your Holy Spirit for it's in Jesus holy name we pray tonight Amen all right, tonight, uh, I guess you can see you're stuck with me tonight. We're going to be uh, reading out of Romans chapter 12. We're going to go from verse 1 to verse 21. I'm going to just say a little thing for Pastor tonight. He's uh, preaching a revival this week at West Blockton Church of God. So if you have an opportunity, pull him up online and watch him. I, from what I understand, they've had some great services, and I'm believing they'll have another great service tonight. But uh, tonight we're going to study about uh, Romans Chapter 12, verse 1. If you can put that scripture up for me. This is Paul writing here. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now I'm going to kind of go through uh, and kind of dissect some of this scripture tonight and talk about it. But uh, the first thing that... In the scriptures, it's presenting our body as a living sacrifice. The word is telling us exactly how to do it. We must present. When we're saved, God does not take away our free will. We We can do whatever we want. You know, we can sit on the pew if we want, or we can get up and help. Uh, work in God's church or or whatever He's calling you to do. But He's asking us to present our body a living sacrifice. In other words, we have to offer it. But when we offer ourselves to the Lord, He will always use us in a way that He has designed. But we have to present. It, you know, we have to make that first step. But I promise you, if you make that first step to present yourself to the Lord, He will use you in a great and mighty way. And there's, there's no better way to worship God than to be working for the Lord and doing something for Him and allow Him to pour His Holy Spirit in and through you every day of your life <clears throat> now we're to be a living sacrifice you know it's one thing to be a sacrifice it's one thing to die for somebody but it's another thing to live for somebody to live for the Lord we're to sacrifice what we're sacrificing our flesh right and when we sacrifice our flesh then he can work in our spirit but we've got to sacrifice our sacrifice our flesh before he can work the spirit in and through us But there again, it's our free will. We've got to offer up our free will to be a living sacrifice and to be holy and acceptable to God. He wants us to be holy. There's many scriptures in the Bible that tell us this, but he wants us to live holy. That's the only way he can use us. He can't use us if we're not holy. You ever thought about that? We've got to be living for him. We've got to be living right to be used by Christ. And I just want to ask you tonight, are you living for him? It was something I can remember growing up with my grandparents around and my grandmother would always ask anybody she met, how is your walk with the Lord? And as a young teenager, I didn't quite understand what that meant. How is your walk with the Lord? She was asking everybody she met, are you living for the Lord? She didn't ever ask, are you saved? She wanted to know how your walk was. And I think we should ask that more today. How is your walk today? Because it is a walk. And that's for all of us. See, when we get saved, it's it's not about us anymore. We're to serve Christ. And to serve him, it can't be about us and be about Christ at the same time. But he wants us to understand that. Our life is his. Once he saves us, we are his. We are bought with a price. All right, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, 
but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now here we see it, the first, first part of this scripture, don't be conformed by this world. Now what are we seeing in this world every day? What's this world trying to do to us? Trying to make us conform to it. Every day, every day, you know, the, the world's pulling against us to conform to whatever they're trying to, to, to talk us into being like. But the Bible tells us not to be conformed by, to, by this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Now, for our mind to be renewed, we've got to stay in His Word and we've got to stay in prayer. If you'll stay in the Word and you'll stay in prayer, He will renew your mind. And, and as our mind is being renewed by Christ in His Word, that's how we stay away from the worldly ways. And, and that's how we know that the world is wrong, that the things that they're trying to pull us into is wrong. And the only way, only way we know it's wrong is we must know our Word. Because what the world has to offer is a counterfeit. But only what God has in his word is, is true for you and I. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, we must be seeking God's will in our life. We need to be used by him, but we must seek his will in our life to be able to be used. It's very important for the mind to be renewed. As we are renewed, God shows his will to us as we grow. We must grow in him for us to Him to continue to show his will in our life. And for me, that has been, I have to be obedient to what he told me to do yesterday. If I want to see his will today, I have to do what he told me to do yesterday. And that's part of growing in Christ. And that's, that builds my faith as well when I do that. Yes, sir. Amen. His will is always better for you than your will. Always. We think we know what we want. We think we know what is better for us, but only God knows what is better for us. And I've learned in my life, only God knows what will keep me happy. I don't even know what will keep me happy, but he knows. But I have to seek his will and I have to walk out his will for him, him to continue to show me that in my life. And for some reason for me, God never shows me his will all for the next year. I have to walk it out one day at a time and be obedient one day at a time. And I think that's just important for me to build my faith, is walking it out every day, trusting him. But as I walk it out today, I'm reminded of his will yesterday and how he covered me and protected me and took care of me and did whatever I needed yesterday. So that reminds me, part of his will is to take care of me today and even for tomorrow. Walking in his will, there's nothing like it. You don't want to get outside God's will, I promise you that. <laughs> Stay in his will. All right, verse 3. <clears throat> For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. <laughs> First part of that scripture <laughs> 
There's a reason why he puts that in there. Have you ever met anybody that just thinks more highly of themselves than they ought? I, Shannon and I kid about this all the time. I can spend two minutes with somebody, and I'll tell her, I said, that person thinks more highly of himself than he ought. <laughs> That's straight out of the Bible right there. <clears throat> but it's important for us to not think that way. Why? Because it's not about me. Whatever ability or talent or whatever blessing you might have, it's come from, from God. <laughs> because we're His. Now, without Jesus, we are nothing, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. See, we, we can't be anything without Christ. We can't even walk around. He provides everything. We, he provides our breath that we breathe. That's how important Christ is to us, whether we know it or not. But never think more highly of yourself than you ought to. And the second part of that is, without Jesus, we're... We're nothing as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Faith. When you're, when you're saved, God gives you a, a measure of faith right then. You have to have faith to be, be saved, right? No one can be saved without believing in Christ first and foremost. Well, I think personally from, from that day forward, our faith is to grow. One of the best ways for it to grow is walking out in his will, staying in his word and praying and living by his word. That's what it takes for us to grow as a Christian. But it is a walk. Every day as a Christian is a walk. And it builds us up. And God gives more faith as we grow in Him. I have more faith today than I did last year. Why is that? Because I can remember what Christ has done for me in the last year. And how He's taken care of me. And I'm not just speaking of money type things. There's so many ways that, that God takes care of us. I was telling somebody before church tonight, I, I believe when we get to heaven, for me, I think God's going to show me a, a, a movie screen of, in front of me of all the things he's done in my life that I didn't even know about, how he's taken care of me. He's kept me from harm. I mean, the list can just go on and on, but that's how good he is when we walk in his will. But we have to seek his will and walk it out to get his blessings. But his blessings are, are, I don't think we can count them all. As his children, our blessings are just enormous. And we as earthly parents and grandparents, we're good to our kids and grandkids. Well, just think how good our God is to us because he loves us. That's the way he is. All right, verse 4. For as we have many members in one body... And all members have not the same office. Now, everyone has a different function in the body of Christ. Now, I'll start off talking about the body of Christ as all Christians are part of God's body. But then we have a local body, a local church here. And everybody here has a, uh, a different function. I, I've always been amazed through the years, even when Pastor Eubanks was, was our pastor here, the different things we would have going on that would be led by the pastor of, of whatever ministry we were going to be doing as a church, how God would send certain people in for that time. Whatever we needed, God sent the people here to do it. Why? Because we're, we're a body. <laughs> and that's important to understand that everybody has a function and no one person is more important, important than any other. We're all important here. That's why God has us here together. I think God has you here for this time, appointed time at this church as well. Because it's part of God's plan. And I, I want to be a, God, a part of God's plan. No matter what is going on, I want to be in the middle of it. When the Lord comes back to get, get me, I want to be doing something for Him whenever that time is. All right, verse 5. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. God's church needs different people. He, he needs different folks at this church. Everybody shouldn't look the same. Everybody should not, not have the same exact thoughts because then we couldn't do certain ministries. I mean, y'all don't want me in there working in the nursery, you know. 
But there are people here at this church that are called for that. And I promise you, you want a nursery because if we didn't have a nursery here on Sunday mornings, it would be kind of disruptive. <laughs> so it's, it's very important that we have all the people that we have at this church. And we need different groups of people here, all different nationalities. It's very important that this church has different nationalities of people. Why? Because when we get to heaven, there's gonna, we're all going to be there together then. I think church is it's just kind of a warm-up for when we get to heaven. We're all important to God. Red, yellow, black, and white, we're all precious in His sight. So that's the way church should be as well. All right, uh, verse 6 now. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of our faith. God has people with different gifts operating in the church for his purpose. Now remember, it's about his purpose, not about us. And God gives the gift. God gives the gifts. I don't just get to say, okay, God, I'm going to practice up till I can speak in tongues and, and give out a message in tongues. It doesn't work that way. Right? God, God gives it. It's his. And it's to bring glory to him. Whatever gift God has given you, it's not to bring glory to you because it's not about me and it's not about you. It's all about Christ. <clears throat> and I'm thankful that this church has all of the gifts in operation. To me, that's one of the signs of a healthy church when, when the gifts are in operation in a church. If I go to a Pentecostal church and, and it's, I never hear anybody speaking in tongues and I never hear an interpretation, uh, and then I, I'm like, hmm, this is Pentecost light, and it's not for me. That, but that's just me. But, but there's many other ways, many other gifts that work in a church. It's, I'm not just going to harp on speaking in tongues, the gift of speaking in tongues, because there's many other things that need to operate in a church that are very important for a church to be healthy. We need all of it. That's why God gives people the gifts to operate in, in that particular body. All right, verse 7. This is kind of a continuation. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teaches on teaching. Whatever you're calling and you're gifting, you should be using it in church. Whatever God's blessed you with, and everybody has a talent, everybody has a gift, some type of gift, are you using it in church? It's just something to think about there. It's very important that you give it back to God because everybody has some type of gift. I know for me, I, I build houses and I try to help people whenever I can in certain things, working on houses and what have you. And I, I feel that's the Lord requires that of me, ask me to do that, to use my gift that I do for making a living to help touch other people as well. And I, whatever gift you might have, I'm sure he can use you in certain things around the church as well. But uh, it's very important for the church for people to operate in their gift and give our gift back to the Lord. I believe we'll be held accountable to whatever God has gifted you in. If When you, when you stand before the Lord one day, he's going to ask you, what did you do with what I gave you? And we'll all answer that question individually. Did we give it back to him and realize it came from him? Because we first have to do that. We have to realize it all comes from him. I, I call it on loan. Whatever he gives me is just on loan because I can't take it to heaven with me anyway, whatever it might be. It's all on loan, but we have to remember who gives it to loan it to us. All right, verse 8 here. Are he that exhorteth? On exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. These are some of the gifts needed in the church. Serve in your gift unto God with all your heart. Whatever, God, whatever gifts God has, has put in your life, 
do it 110% for Christ. Don't worry about any, doing it for anybody else that they see you, that they ever pat you on the back or whatever. Because some people will never pat you on the back. If you do something good for them, they may not ever thank you, even thank you for it. But remember who you're doing it for. It's all for him. I've had times I've helped people out and I never got a thank you, but I'm, I'm okay with that because I know the Lord told me to do it. And when I do it, it's in his hands. You trust him from then on. It's his. You just be the obedient servant. Because we are servants, right? That's another thing we have to understand. We are servants. Just a funny thing about Children's Church, several years ago they had a slogan of serve ant. Be a serve, serve like an ant, like a little ant. And that just reminded me that's what I am. I'm like, I'm like a little ant. I'm nothing big, but I'm going to serve like that little ant. But I don't know if you've ever seen ants, if you ever torn down their, their ant bed in the afternoon and then come back out the next morning, guess what they'll do? They'll have one bigger than they had the day before. Now, how those little ants can do that, I don't know. But it reminds me that they're very diligent in what they do. And that's what you and I should be. We should be diligent about what God has you to do. Do it with all your heart, mind, soul, and body. And for me, I was taught as a kid, that's part of worship. When I serve Christ, that's, that's as part of my worship as, as anything else we do here in, in the congregation. Serving Christ is very important for all of us. All right, verse 9. We're going to get down to some nitty-gritty right here. Let love be without dissimulation. And that means not pretending. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. And abhor means to hate. You know, we're to hate evil. And aren't we seeing a lot of evil in this day and time we're living in? You don't have to go very far from your house to see evil right now, I promise you. Evil is everywhere. Now, we as Christians should hate evil and love good, but we should also hate sin, but not the sinner. There's a difference. We still have to love the sinner, and sometimes that's hard to do. It takes the Holy Spirit in us to do that. But we, we, we do need to love on the sinner. Somehow, some way, they need to see the love of Christ in us. Because if they don't see it in us, who are they going to see it from? All right, let's move on to verse 10. Be kindful, affectionate one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. We should not be selfish and think of ourselves only. We should care for one another. But one thing we have to do to take care of one another is we've got to spend some time with one another. You can't love on somebody if you don't know them. Eh. Right? I, I had the opportunity to grow up in a small church where everybody knew everybody. Everybody prayed for one another. And I'm not saying we don't do that here, but that's one thing I miss about a smaller church. It's, it's knowing everybody. And, and I, I'm going to just talk about me tonight. I don't know everybody in this church, and that's my own fault. I should know everybody in this church because I can't love on people that I don't know, and that's the same with any of us. Now, this scripture is not, not going to show up here tonight, but uh, John chapter 13, verse 35 tells us they will know us by our love for one another. Who is they? That's the sinner. That's the center. That's the people out there looking in. They're looking to see if we're going to take care of one another. Right? There's people that will come in here on Sunday mornings and that's what they're looking to see. They're going to look and see how we interact with one another here. How we interact with them. But they want to know that we, we, we love one another. Because if they don't see us loving one another, why would they want to be a part of us? They're not going to come and join a church when the people aren't taking care of one another. And that falls on all of us. 
Uh, that's not to the pastor or the staff. That's you and I. It's one thing for a staff member to love on somebody, but it's another thing for one of the sheep to love on another sheep. There's a difference in that. But we got to show love. Because people know whether we really know them or not. Yes, sir. Amen. That's right. Amen. 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 Amen, Brother Eubanks. That's very good. Uh, I was talking with a brother here tonight and a, a few weeks ago about this very issue. And he had asked me, he says, why don't the men of this church spend, spend some time with one another? Why don't they get together and do things? And I said, Brother, the only thing I can think of is we are all think we're too busy to spend time with one another, which is sad. <laughs> and we are. We're all too busy. And that's why we don't love on the, the people that come in here on Sunday mornings is we're too busy, or we think we are. And if we're too busy to love on one another, we're, then, we're, we're just too busy. But we all should remember that some of us, the reason we're here is because somebody loved on us. Where would any of us be tonight if somebody hadn't shown the love of Christ to us. Well, we've got to keep that going on. And we have to show it to our kids. These kids that are here, they need to see us loving on people. And you know what? It takes a sacrifice. Sacrifice is time. Sometimes it sacrifices money. Whatever it is. But see, that's part of sacrificing that flesh so the spirit can be built up and strengthened. And that, that's for all of us, I believe. I don't care how long you've been saved. Nobody arrives till we get to heaven. That's for all of us. Lord's still working on all of us. But I ask you to challenge yourself tonight. Come Sunday morning, see if the Lord will put somebody on your heart to go pray with, to encourage. Nothing else encourages somebody. But if you need encouraging, you need to tell somebody. We can't read your mind around here. If you're going through something, having an issue, let somebody know so we can love on you. And if you've had a great week, come tell somebody so you can encourage somebody else. In other words, there's something you can do every week. Every time these doors are open, you can come in here and spread the love of Christ and be part of what he's wanting to do in your life.
because he is wanting to do something different in all of our lives and to grow us. It's all about growing us, guys, growing us in the spirit so we can be used by him. I'm convinced what I go through today is preparing me for something else coming later on. Whatever issues I'm dealing with, once I get through it and the Lord strengthens me in it, then I'm hoping I can pass it on to somebody else one day. That's part of love. Loving on people and praying for people. You have a testimony you could tell somebody here on a Sunday morning that the Lord will lead you to that needs to hear just what you've been through and how God has brought you through it and out of it. That's another part of love, sharing your testimony. All right, let's move on now to verse 11. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, and serving the Lord. We should be totally committed to what God has called us to do. Never forgetting we're serving Jesus, not for man to reward. And I've already kind of hit on that already. But we never do something to be seen by other people. There's times I help people that I don't even want them to know that I helped them. I'm not their savior. Now, there's times when it's okay for them to know it's me, but there's other times the Lord will say, you do this and you don't let them know you've done it. Because whatever God's working in their life, they need to keep their eye on him. They don't need to get distracted by me because it's never about me and it's never about you. It's about being that vessel that can be used by God at any given time in any given way that he's calling you to do. Be obedient in that. And never grow weary in well-doing. And why is that? Because heaven is, heaven is waiting for all of us. I think we're closer now than we've ever been. He could come at any time. That's why we've got to be about the Father's business and not about our business. If you'll be about the Father's business, I promise you he'll take care of your business. Keep him first. Stay strong for the Lord in this day and time that we're all living in right now. It's a very tough time to be living in. That's why we've got to stay close to him, guys. Stay close to the Lord. Let him draw you in. I, I believe if we draw, draw close to him, he'll draw close to us. You make that step closer to him and, and watch how he'll move, you clo move closer to you. Verse 12. I'm going to kind of go through each one of these words in this verse here. It's a very good verse here. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Notice the order of this. I'm going to rejoice in hope. <laughs> He's the only hope I've got. I'm reminded of that every day that I walk in this evil world that we live in. I have no hope in this world. This world is going downhill more and more every day. It used to be it, this world got worse every year, but the timeline has accelerated so much it gets worse every day. It moves further and further away from God every day. But I'm thankful this world is not my home. But I'm going to rejoice in the hope I have in Jesus Christ. That he's going to come back for you and I. And I believe it's going to be soon. But you and I have got to be ready. If we're going to go, we've got to be ready. And my goal in life is when I leave here, I want to take as many people with me as I can when I, when I go to heaven. I don't want to see anybody that I know left behind on this earth whenever Christ comes back. You think it's evil now, wait to after the rapture. If you could only imagine how it's going to be. When the saints are, are taken away from here, you don't want to be walking the streets of anywhere on this earth after that. Rejoice in the hope, though, that we have in Jesus Christ. We're his, but he's also ours. Be patient in tribulation. Oh, that's tough right there. Nobody wants to talk about tribulation. Now, I personally believe we're going we're gonna to leave out of here before the tribulation time starts. That's just my personal belief. But I also believe I could deal with some, some tribulation in my life. But that verse tells me 
that I will have to deal with some tribulation in my life and that I've got to be patient in it. Now, I'm, I'm, Lord, Shannon can tell you I really have to work or the Lord has to work on my patience. I have to let him work on my patience. So I, I, being patient, especially in tribulation, is tough for me. But the Lord has promised to help us in it and give us patience when we walk through tribulation. Last verse here, last part of that verse, but I think it's the most important part of it, continuing instant in prayer. Notice it says we continue in prayer, but we do it instant. In other words, the first thing we need to do is pray. We don't stop and complain <laughs> or call a friend or whatever it might be. Continue instant in prayer. That's the best thing we can do at any given time that you're walking through some that you've dealt with tribulation. The best thing you can do is pray. Pray. Now, we, we pray for one another, and that's great, and we need to do that, but that still doesn't take away from me praying for myself. Right? In other words, I can't rely on somebody else to, to just be praying for me and I never pray for myself. Because there's something about when we touch heaven, when we talk to the Lord and allow him to speak back to us, that's when that peace that passes all understanding comes. I've walked through many things in my life that were very tough, but somehow the Lord gave me peace. Yes, sir. No, no, sir. It's coming. That's right. Amen. Amen. So very true. And I, and I feel as Pastor Eubanks does, if, if, uh, if the rapture don't come soon, this right here will be called hate speech one day because it speaks against abortion. It speaks against gay marriage and all the things that go with all of that. And they're going to come in and tell us we can't preach certain things one day. If the Lord tarries, we will have to deal with that. And what that's going to, if that day ever comes, it's going to separate those that are playing church and those that are really living for the Lord. 
Now, I pray the Lord comes before we ever see that. But as Brother Eubank speaks there, if you look back in history at all the, the great men and women of God and all the tribulation they've had to deal with, who am I to expect to get out of this world without having to deal with any tribulation? I don't know. I just know that we live under God's grace and mercy. But I do know we just think we've dealt with some hard times in our life. And we think we've been tested. But we haven't been tested in this country. You go overseas. Go, go to a, a mission field somewhere and you'll see how it really is to live for the Lord. And the sacrifices it takes. But we've got to stay instant in prayer. If you ever have to walk through tribulation, just remember this scripture right here. You got to stay instant in prayer. You got to stay in prayer because you're not going to make it in the flesh. You'll never make it in the flesh fighting spiritual battles. And dealing with tribulation is a spiritual battle. It will test your faith. All right, we'll move on from that. Verse 13. Distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. In other words, we've got to take care of one another. If we don't take care of, of one another, who, we, who will take care of us? We're family. You know why we take care of one another? Because we're family here. Church people are family, and we take care of our, our own. Straight out of the Bible right there. Our time's getting away from us, so mom will kind of move on here a little, little bit. Verse 14. Bless them which, which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Now, first off, as Christians, we should never curse anyone. As, as, as a child of God, that is not something we do. You'll never be able to bless those who persecute you without the Holy Spirit's help. You can't do it within your flesh. The Holy Spirit has to help you with this. You may have a time in your life or you may have already come through a time in your life when somebody has persecuted you. But you're supposed to bless and curse not. Verse 15. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Now we should feel what our brothers and sisters feel. And part of that is if your brother and sister is blessed, you should be rejoicing for them. You should never be envious you should never be whining to the Lord Lord why not me why haven't you blessed me like you blessed them you should rejoice for that person be happy for them but on the same token if a brother or sister is going through a tough time it says you should weep with them when was the last time you wept for somebody that was having a tough time in their life when was the last time you pleaded with the Lord, Lord, please help my brother, my sister. Lord, they can't make it without you. We have people in this church that need us pleading for them right now. I talked with a brother out in the foyer this Sunday after church, going through a very tough time, very depressed. He has to have a miracle from the Lord. And I, right now I am pleading with the Lord, please give this brother whatever he's needing from you. If it be your will. But on the other hand, we don't know what God is doing in that person's life through whatever they're going through. I understand that. But on that, I pray for this brother. Lord, give him the strength to make it through whatever it is you're trying to teach him through. Grow him up in this, Lord. Help him. But we, we need to care that much for one another. And not just pray for him here at church. Pray for him all through the week. When we know somebody's going through a tough time, we need to continually keep them up in prayer. Keep their name up before the Lord. And don't stop until you see the Lord work in their life. Because sometimes people just can't, they're so weak, they can't pray for themselves. They don't know how to pray for themselves anymore. And I'm thankful when people come to church and they're that way. That's one of the best things you can do. If, if you're having a tough time, don't stay at home. Don't, don't. Stay isolated. The devil loves when you stay isolated. 
Come to church. Tell somebody what you're going through. Come to this altar. Let people gather around you and pray for you and lay hands on you. That's a sign in being, knowing you're part of God's family. You know where to go for your help. Don't let the devil isolate you in any, any given time that you're walking through trials and tribulations in your life. Have a heart of compassion. Are we compassionate? The church should be compassionate. Do you show compassion? I promise you, if you go through a tough time, you'll want somebody showing compassion to you. So if you're strong, you need to, at any given time, you should show somebody the weaker your compassion. All right, verse 16. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. We must love one another equally. In other words, I can't love. Lord tells me not to be loving on somebody because they come in here in a fancy suit and they look like whatever, GQ, whatever. You know, that's not what it's about in God's house amongst God's people. Everybody should be treated the same. If somebody walks in off the street looking like they live on the street, we should love on them the same as we would anybody else. Maybe more so because that person needs it more than anybody else. That's part of showing compassion, showing Christ to other people. And I believe the Lord's show, wanting to show His love through us to others. He wants us to be that vessel. I call it a vessel of honor that can be used for him. But we have to sacrifice our time, our talent, what we think about somebody, because it doesn't matter what I think about somebody. See, when, when I, I think of it, uh, well, I don't think very much of that person, then I'm showing selfishness, then I'm showing me, I'm not showing Christ. To show Christ, I've got to get out of my thoughts what I feel or what I don't feel to be that vessel for him. Verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. We should not have an I will pay you back mentality. Two wrongs never make a right. You don't pay somebody evil for evil. See, first off, we're not evil. As Christians, we're not evil. So we shouldn't be trying to do evil things to people even though they do evil to us. Don't play the game. You'll never win. You'll never win if you stoop to that person's level. They'll drag you down to their level, and it's not a place a child of God should ever, should ever be in. Verse 18. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Now look at the first part of that. If it be possible. Hmm. In other words, first and foremost, we're going to be seeking peace. We come out of the gate seeking peace. You know. But, how many of us know there's, there's times when there's just certain people that they're just not going to live in peace. I call them drama people. Just always looking to stir up something. Always just, just got to be in the middle of whatever. Got to have a negative thing to say. Can't walk away and just let it be. That's a tough person to be, to deal with. For people that don't like peace, I'm just not going to be around you very long. Now, if you come after me and corner me, then we, it's going to be on. But I'm going to try to get away from you. <laughs> but don't get me in a corner <laughs> with your drama. Has anybody else ever been that way? Well, see, I, I can say that because it said, if it be possible. So, <laughs> But as Christians, we, we are to be always seeking, we are to be seeking peace. Why is that? Because Christ is peace. And if we're full of his peace, then we can show peace. We can walk in peace. And we can try to show that person how to have peace if they'll let us. All right, verse 19. 
Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. Now see, this ties in with that last verse. But rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Oh, I promise you, you're better off letting the Lord deal with the vengeance thing and you not get involved in it. (laughs) Because his vengeance is just so much, I don't know, sweeter than anything I could have ever thought of. But let the Lord deal with people. Walk away. Keep the peace and walk away whenever possible. But never go out for vengeance. Never. But and Let me just say something on that. If you go out there and get your vengeance, I think for the most part, then the Lord's done with the issue. And he backs off and lets you get your vengeance. But you also get all that goes on along with your vengeance. You can choose to take your vengeance on somebody, but you don't get to choose the consequences that follow that vengeance that you just took. That's one reason why I believe the Lord says for you to allow him to do it. That way we don't have to deal with anything that comes after that. But we have to trust in the Lord, right? We've got to trust in him. We've got to show that faith in him. And, and I promise you this, the Lord sees what, goes, what somebody has done to you. The Lord's seen it. Now, he may not have acted immediately that you get to see anyway. He may be working on that other person to try to get them to repent. And see, that's the best part of it. You want to see that person repent and change their ways. That's the way a Christian should be praying. Right? But, but we can't do that in our flesh, right? Because our flesh wants, wants that vengeance. We've we got we to get back to the Spirit, stay in the Spirit, rather. To allow the Lord to do what he wants to do in them and through us. I promise you if you'll let him deal with the people, he'll work something in you as well. He'll grow you up a little bit and he'll put more faith in you when you trust him to work it all out. See, the Christian life is just all about trusting God. Having faith, walking our faith out in him every day. And never forgetting Nothing takes him by surprise. Nothing. And he's promised, what has he promised to us? He's promised to work all things together for us. If we're trusting in him, he's going to work it for our good and his glory. Because when you get through this trial and tribulation, whatever it might be, then you're going to have a testimony on the other side of it. Okay, let's move on now to verse 20. We've got two more verses here. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Can you picture that? You ever got a picture of that? What that's telling me, it's talking about food and drink, but what it's really talking about, whatever your enemy is in need of, you should provide. In other words, there again, that's part of that faith thing. You step out there and you willingly go and provide for that enemy whatever it is they need. And I believe the Lord will show you whatever they might need. Because see, it doesn't have much effect on them if you're giving them something they don't need. But if the Lord will show you something they need and you can provide it, then the Lord's going to work on them and he's going to work on you at the same time. What an awesome thing to think about. Now, we want to concentrate on, Lord, heap those coals of fire on their head. Right? We we see that, and that's what we get out of that verse. We want to concentrate on, I can picture them coals on that head right now, so I'm going to do do this. I'm going to do what this scripture says, so I get to see that coals of fire on his head. But I promise you, the best thing you could ever see, instead of the coals of fire on the head, is see them change and turn their life around for Jesus Christ. Because that's what the Lord's really wanting us to do, to have that that heart of I want to see them repent. I want to see them go to heaven. I don't want to see them continue down the path that they're on. All right, last scripture here in Romans chapter 12, verse 21. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And I talked about that when we first started tonight. We're seeing a lot of evil all around us every day of our life. 
But it says, don't be overcome by it. Don't let it bother you. It didn't take the Lord by surprise that we're having to deal with evil. We walk through evil in this old world every day. And it, it just makes us feel dirty. I know sometimes after being out in it all day, dealing with some of the people that I deal with in my business, I come home and I just feel dirty, you know. Uh, and sometimes when I'm out working, I'll have to take, go out and sit in the truck a while and have a time of prayer <laughs> to deal with certain things because of how evil this world is. But to overcome that, we just need to do what the Lord's telling us to do. Follow these scriptures right here and apply them every day of our life. That's how we overcome the evil that we deal with every day. And the Lord has a way of escape. Thank goodness. That's in the word. He has planned the way of escape for us. But we've got to seek for it. We've got to stay in the spirit and not in the flesh to be able to find that way of escape and to do good. This world needs to see people doing good. They see plenty of people doing evil. And one thing that I've noticed in my life, so many people don't want to hear me talk anymore about Christ. So what the Lord tells me to do, okay, I'm going to just show him. Every, day, every time you see me, I'm going to show you Jesus. we got to walk it out in front of him. That's how we overcome evil with good. You just keep doing what the Lord has called you to do. Don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged. Don't get weary in well-doing. That's what the devil wants us to do. He wants us to get weary in well-doing and give up right here before the Lord comes back. But we've come too far to turn back now. I've lived for the Lord a long time and I'm going to continue no matter what comes my way. I don't care what persecution comes. I have a made-up mind. And I have a made-up mind because of what God has done in my life and what he does in my life and what he's going to do in my life. And most of all, because I know how this book ends. I don't care what I see in front of me every day in evil. I know how the story ends. Jesus has already won this battle, guys. We just have to stay in touch with him, continue to live for Christ until we get to see his face. We have tough days. I don't want to make light of anything anybody's going through in this sanctuary tonight. But you just hang on because this too will pass. Trust in the Lord. Trust in Him. What else are you going to do? I sure can't trust in my government. <laughs> God's going to take care of us. He hadn't brought us this far to turn back now. He will see us to the end and he has promised in his word what he has started in her life he will finish but I believe he's going to work on me to the day he comes back he's not done working on me yet how about you if y'all will stand with me tonight I appreciate everybody being here this evening I pray you have a blessed remainder of the week and I hope you come back Sunday ready to praise and worship the Lord and maybe let the Lord use you to touch somebody in this place on Sunday morning. Amen. So to Debbie reminds me we are having prayer here at church at 3 p.m. Sunday afternoon. Please come. There's a lot of important things we need to pray about, not just the election, but our country. We need to plead the blood of Jesus over our country. Amen. Y'all pray with me. Yeah, Brother Bain. That's right. The clock goes forward one hour. No, no, I'm sorry. Scratch that. Back. Fall back and spring forward. That's right. If you don't do the clock right, you're going to show up here too early. So, anyway. <laughs> Well, that's a whole different lesson there. So, Anyway, let's pray together before we go. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word here tonight, Lord. We thank you for saving us here tonight, Lord. We're, we're nothing without you, Lord. We just pray, Lord, that we apply what we've heard through your word here tonight to our life, Lord. 
Lord, help us in every way of everything that we do, Lord, for we're nothing without you, Lord. For it's in Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.